welcome to Turn Right Machine Works. My name is Keith. And today I have a small job I want to bring you in on just so that uh, uh, you can see how I go about making some tooling. You need to make up tooling from time to time. And some of this tooling I've made over the years and some of it I'm going to make right today. The main job we have is we have another set of large struts, although these struts aren't quite as large as the one that we needed to use our three inch boring bar. Um, these are a little bit smaller and these are bronze versus stainless steel. Uh, just something about bronze. I think, I think bronze to men is like diamonds to, to girls, you know, it's a, it is, uh, it is amazing that we can cast that in and, uh, and and it's, uh, I think it's just the, the statue of the color. Um, who knows what it is, but uh, bronze always does look cool to me. Um, and anyway, this is, this is gonna have a cutlass bearing. It's gonna have a cutlass bearing installed to it. So we're actually gonna be opening up this quite a bit, but its starter hole is, oh, about 200 thousandths over two inch. And it's going to be bored to a depth, have a shoulder, and then a, and then a minor bore. So it's going to be a two-step uh, uh, boring here. My typical way of boring struts is turning the head here and using the um, um, apex head, I believe it is, that I have here. A uh, Chandler, I believe. Let me see. Yeah, this is a Chandler. And uh, Chandler duplex. And... Usually I'm, I use a small bar here. This is wrapped with lead so it doesn't sing. And I have <clears throat> developed a crack into this holder here oh, about five years ago and I've never really got into making a new head for this. So it was either make a new head for this or make another bar for a system that is really proven to be handy uh, by line boring in the lathe. Now, over the before I even had the plasma cam, and actually somebody asked the other day, did you cut these out on the plasma cam? And no, I, I didn't. I, I cut these out with a torch by hand. I put it in a lathe and I bored the center. I set that up on a table, rotary table, and I took a turbo end mill and I kind of roughed this and this off here. And this has still got the torch cut and still got remnants of the torch cut on the top. Um, then I welded them to two flat bars. They have two pins which ride in the T-nut slots on the lathe carriage and two holes to draw them down. And that's how these will mount on the lathe. I have three positions that I can put those in, meaning three T-slots that I can run those. So I can run them close together, which I'm going to have to do for this. This is a foot. My two large spans um, or medium spans are just a little bit over a foot and then I can get out to um, I can get out to about 16 for center to center on my two farthest out ones. But I can run the two close ones together and I'll be able to run and support this with that. Okay. Now I'm going to get this down on the floor here. And we're, we got the blank bar. I've already put it in the lathe. I've already center drilled the end so that I got it, so I can run my support. Um, it spins fairly true. I didn't put on a, uh, a set of rollers um, to check it out um, and I also want to know or uh, just mention here and uh, coming up shortly I'll have the introduction video for my my rollers they all the material came in uh, yesterday and I have a little bit more coming in today anyway we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna machine a flat and we're gonna go ahead and install our adjustable tool bit sleeves now I get time I still get asked um, because not everybody reads in the comments and researches the information that's already been said or flips through my videos and actually sees the video that I've already mentioned it, but I will mention it again. And the reason why everybody has a hard time finding these is they are listed in the book as, and I, I, I get them through MSC, uh, low carbon steel square hole tool bit sleeve. Um, so that's why, you know, if you're looking it up, if you don't know <laughs> that it it can cause a problem all right and here's a picture of that that uh, page there all right uh, we have a, a virgin sleeve here I'm gonna put that back in the toolbox I have one here that is 
I might even trim it just a little bit more, but this is almost exactly the right length for my setup that I'm, I'm going to put in today. Um, we're setting up the bar so that this whole location for this particular setup here will be comfortably from the edge of my bar plus a little bit of working room down the bar from one end. Okay, so I'm this is 12 inch basically, and I'm going to probably set this up somewhere around 14 inch. And then the bar will be long enough to where I can have it set up down the lathe bed long enough to pass the cutter all the way through and work and measure and check both sides of the bore as we're going. And I'll be able to use my travel dial to get the depth and so on. So let me go ahead and get set up here and we're going to just start, we're going to be milling a flat on this bar. And the flat does two things. It, it lets us put our mag base on there, adjust the tool bit. It also gives an area or a void in the bar for chips to uh, clear or ride through. Um, it, 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 does, it does help than having a round bar. Sometimes a round bar will actually just kind of like spin inside a spool or a hub of, of chips that stay stuck in a bore, but most of the time with the flat, you end up kicking them out somehow or another. It works a lot better. If you can get the chip to really break, uh, it, it's kind of nice because you got a little bit of an air gap in there and sometimes you can look down through the tube with a mirror or whatever, or you, you know, not all the time you can get your head down next to your bar and sight down your bar while it's cutting, but you can stick a mirror there and look at it. All right, enough talk here. Let's, uh, let's get some action going. Okay, we got our Sharpie, our tape measure, our little tool bit. Now we said we want to put this about 14 inches from the end, so we're just going to mark this off here real quick just so we can, this is all going to be like eyeball, this is just relief, okay, so there's 14, I think I want my chip relief to end up there, probably start somewhere around 13 there, and we know that we're going to be two foot plus a couple inches here, we want that relief to come down to about right there, so our flat, our flat is actually going to be from right there, about an inch in here, and I'm going to feather it out by just hand cranking out after I've got the depth or the flat that I want in there. I'm going to look at my other bar, the three inch bar, because that's a perfect ratio of flatness uh, to the diameter, and I'm going to see what I actually have, and I'm going to apply that to this two inch in relationship from size to size. All right. Now, I just put in some fresh coolant in here, and everybody, kind of, everybody once in a while will ask, "What kind of coolant do I run in here?" And there, you know, I I do run coolant on the K and T here, and I just changed it out. The coolant I have in here, and I use is called Trim T R I M, and the 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 kind I use is the E two O six. I have been using this kind of coolant now for almost eight years and uh, when I first uh, was searching for a different coolant than the water soluble oil, um, one of my mentors, uh, uh, John Bigwood, he was, uh, he was setting up the shop. He was running, he run a lot of CNC but he also runs a lot of conventional machines as well and for cleanliness, non-foaming, Last in the longest and all of that. He gave me this number here and I've been pretty well stuck on it. I don't bother changing around. If something works, don't change it. Um, and I've been happy with it. So I, you know, everybody has their own preference. I like how slippery this is. I like how it cleans the machine as it's working. And I like how when I get a cut or something like that, I'm not getting infected uh, because I believe the coolant stays fresh longer in, in then when it finally starts going sour, I change it out. So I usually end up changing the coolant out in this machine about every six to eight months. All right, let's go ahead and get set up here. I was given this holder and then I picked up the inserts off of eBay. So this is the first piece of steel it's touched. I've got some aluminum uh, with it lately. And uh, so I'm kind of anxious really to see uh, how this is doing. And uh, 
we're going to go ahead and touch off and we'll start whittling away um, just moving back and forth and then we're going to fare out at each end here when we're all done uh, to get the ramp in. I just don't want a sharp corner in on this flat. I want it to ramp in and ramp out. This is like 412 RPMs right now. And I need my screwdriver to set my depth. I am going to go ahead and put a couple toe clamps at each end here and I'm going to put my bridge back in here. This is a design I've kind of created. I bent my own piece here and you can see that I, I got the flats that normally set in here and they, I, I cut them because I can move my tables, kind of semi set it up. I can also do this and half sheet them. On that side there they kind of clear the, the neck of the, the machine there. Uh, where the head comes out, but uh, that one's going to stand up there, and I'm probably going to stand this one up here as well. We're only going to be cutting in this area, and I need to get a toe clamp here and a toe clamp on here. Just I don't want any vibration or harmonics out there. I know I'm going to be a little ways out here, and I want it secure. Boy, that was fast. Okay, we're secure here. J uh, screw jacks underneath here, and uh, we're just going to go ahead and check our travel here, making sure. That yeah, we'll be able to come out over here. Okay, that's good. I like that. Okay, we're just going to kind of come in here in the middle. Crank this out a little bit. Up. Okay, there's a zero, or close enough to zero. <laughs> Didn't we just get that screwdriver? <laughs> uh. All right. I don't know. Let's go ahead and let's see about an eighth of an inch here. All right. Um, about 320. Okay, there's like two and an eighth inches per minute. Looks like a pretty good chip coming off of there now. Three and a half inches per minute. All right, she's cooking pretty good there now. All right, while that's cutting, I'm gonna go measure the flat on the three inch there. Okay, that was one and three quarters for three inch, okay? So let's go. Uh...
That's like 0.171. One inch 160 is what they say it should be. I'm at one inch now. We'll give it something like one two hundred. That would be comfortable. We are going to offset our tool bit. Let's see. We're going to want to offset our tool bit at least three sixteenths, two hundred thousandths or so. That'll look pretty good. Some firmness in my head here. Okay, yep. That's where I want to start ramping up. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to bring her back to the uh, the other side there, and take her to where I'm going to start the ramp on this side. Okay, right about there. I'm just looking down there until it looks like I'm taking about a hundred per side off that face there. Okay, that looks pretty much like I'll be in that ballpark area of uh, 1200. We're just going to take it right on across there. Let's see what I got here. Yeah, we are one two hundred. I think we're gonna go with that as a flat. Okay, and we're gonna set our depth here at zero, so I can come back and touch this off after I ramp up on the other side there. I'm going to eyeball my cutter in the center. That's close enough. <coughs> okay, we're going to feed it down at this end first. And when I get to the end here, then I'm going to slowly ramp it down and we're going to come up and create a radius there so it's a nice smooth transition. Not really worried about the finish just nice clean we'll, we'll uh, hit it with the uh, rotary scotch right there afterwards just to take anything off it's cut and cr pretty crisp and clean
the head might be up just slightly. I am getting a little bit of a back cut on this side over here. Something you look for sometimes if you're coming in and you're trying to blend in a lot of cuts. Okay, I just I just put you over there. We're coming up on this section right here, and I just want to show you that I'm gonna go when it gets to the position I want. I'm just gonna kind of pick my own motion to be in time. We're traveling about three and a half inches a minute, but I'm gonna be just watching it, and I'm gonna pick a pace, and then I'm just gonna go ahead and create a constant pace there, so that I'm just gonna ramp up itself. And here we go. Whatever you do, just stay constant with it. And the ramp will kind of look constant as it comes up. Okay, we're gonna come back here. And uh, I'm gonna come back down to my zero coming up on it all right and I'm there all right now same thing when I get when I get to this one here, I'm going to do the same thing and just in the reverse direction here. Let me bring you in on that. All right, I came down. Once I came down to my zero, then I lightly came down till I saw it touching here. So that's why we got that other little swirl there. And then as I was leaving, it was stopping the cut here. So um, I guess it was back cutting in both directions slightly, uh, which I no problem there. Like I said, this is not a surface uh, condition type of cut. But I did want this to be nice and smooth, and now I'm going to go ahead and feather this and this over here. So you're able to go ahead and get an entrance and an exit without doing anything other than using the same tool that you have. You didn't have to set it up and cut an angle and cut an angle. Just just be constant and steady on your uh, on your uh, motion, and you'll be able to come out. This is real common. I used to I learned to do this with end mill cuts so that you can radius out on the outside and you didn't leave yourself a stress rise area at the end of your keyways. So there you go. We're here in the Bridgeport now and we're going to go ahead and put the hole in it so we can put our insert in here 
and the very first thing is I got this in the in the vise here and I'm going to rotate it so that it's it is uh, level with the machine here to a reasonable position here okay I'm happy with that all right I'll we'll put our uh, scale back in here there we go all right we're gonna dye it somewhere right around in here a little bit of a sharpie on there okay our scribe our square and we were talking about 14 that's that's close enough right there there we go wasn't quite dry enough all right I uh, just double checked I take my tap follower sometimes and I just lightly screw it in here and I came down and I verified that my readout was zero with the edge I hadn't changed it I just wanted to confirm that I did set it to the vise and it looks like it's 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 there since the last time I checked the vise if this was a super critical part I would recheck it physically with the edge finder and so on but for right now I'm just gonna go ahead and take it there I'm close enough I that's an eyeball zero all right I'm going to grab one of my other screw jacks from the other setup there and all I'm doing is just putting it for a little bit of pressure under the end here. I'm not going to toe clamp this down. All right. Now, um, center of that bar would be coming out one inch. This is a two inch bar. So we come out one inch there. Actually, I don't know why I removed that yet. All right, we're going to go ahead and run down here to the 14 inch mark. Okay, my eyeball there. And we eyeball it. Actually, if we put our scale on here and we put it across that line right there, we should be coming down. See, about 1, 200. That should be coming down about 6. And it is right there. Um, now, we want to offset, and we, we're going to be turning clockwise, so we kind of want to offset the hole to the back side. It's going to be my common direction that I'm going to bore with this most of the time. So I'm going to go ahead and feed the table in that direction uh, so that I can put center line on my tool bit. And I'm going to go ahead and grab one of my tool bits so that I can actually see how that is in relationship to the square. Okay. I have two different angle cutters. This just happens to be one. I think this is 45 and there's another one that's 30. And then this is a straight shouldered insert. But they both have positive rake on the top side. And then I shape this back side here to have a, plenty of clearance on the rotation. And actually th the way our bar is, I'm going to be running these in this direction. So the whole offset is going to be coming this way here so that we can keep this on center or above center. Now sometimes the leading edges of your tool bits aren't quite even with the top side of your square or your your shank that it mounts. They're brazed on and sometimes they're back or down a little bit farther. So you don't want to go any farther than than half of your your distance of of your thickness there in fact it's almost preferable if you go slightly less than half of that so that um, you even if you sharpen this down a little bit on the top I mean you got about a hundred thousandths worth of of carbide there to work with but most of the time you, you you're gonna be up where it's fairly fresh there and uh, and close to the square of the diameter so but when you do sharpen it down you want to still have a working tool bit and you need to have it center line or above center line on a bore of a, of a cut and uh, most of the time you're you're cutting on your face of it so uh, your, your tool pressure is not so much off of the end of your cutter where you're not plunging into it like uh, making a C-clip ring or something like that. 
or parting off from the inside. Um, so what I'm what I'm getting at is we're going to go ahead. This is center. And we want to move it. We want to move it over. Uh, this is three eighths here, so half of three eighths would be three sixteenths, um, and that's like one eight seven five. And we can just shorten that up about thirty thousandths. That will kind of uh, offset there. So I just say one hundred and fifty thousandths. I'm going to move this over, and that's just on the my best guesstimation of where I actually want. I want to have a little bit of offset so I can keep that center, but I also want to have enough allowance so that looks pretty good. And there again the tool bit is going to be in there and this is going to be the direction it's traveling with either bit. All right, we're going to put in a center drill, not the drill center drill, just to go ahead and spot a start spot, and then we're going to step drill it. Um, and I was just thinking about it. <clears throat> the reason why you would want to offset your tool bit on a boring bar is to get it closer to being on center. If you drill a hole straight through your bar, your tool bit is going to be half the, the width of your tool bit above the bar. Um, maximum and you want to bring that cutting edge down closer to center line so that when you're feeding it out and you're reading the depth or the or you're you're setting your next depth of cut you're going to be closer and truer to a true diameter position than you would be if you were slightly above or farther above center line so it it it, it helps on the cutting action but it also increases or uh, uh, tightens up your adjustment to what you actually want to take and what it actually does take. All right, with that said, okay, just spotted that there. And drop down just a little bit here. Go in the right direction and grab my oil can here. Stepping it up to close to finish size because we're going to do a drill finish with a nice, uh, pretty nice drill anyway. At least we, I'm pretty sure it's a pretty nice drill. For an import anyway. I got that.